Good afternoon, AY. Thank you so much for joining us, whether via the virtual world or in church. We're going to start our AY song service with a few choruses. So we'll start with We're Together Again. We are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again, in one accord. Something good is going to happen, something good is in store. We are together again, just praising the Lord. Again, we are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again in one accord. Something good is going to happen, something good is in store. We are together again, just praising the Lord. Jesus, Jesus' name, 
The scripture reading is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for yet another Sabbath day. Lord, thank you for the blessing of the first services. Please bless the sec the evening service so that we all may be blessed in your name i pray amen happy sabbath everyone we will now be doing the ay emblems the aim the advent message to all the world in my generation the motto the love of christ compels me the pledge Loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the Advent Youth Society, doing what I can do to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. We will now have the AY song. Adventist youth are we from every land and sea. Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth. 
Adventist youth. I'm sorry about everyone. I hope everyone is keeping safe, staying blessed, you know, content to hold in, hold in the promises of the Lord um, as we continue to go through these difficult times. Um, I'll be doing the morning watch and I will start up, I will be starting off with Sunday. Um, it reads Proverbs 5, verse 3 and 4. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her, but, but her, and, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. Now on to Monday. Psalm 101 verse 3 and it reads, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside it. Shall n turn aside, it shall not cleave to me. Now on to Tuesday, Proverbs 13 verse 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathered by labor shall increase. Now on to Wednesday, Proverbs Chapter 23, verse 31 and 32. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it, it giveth it, when it giveth it its colour in the cup, when it moveth it itself aright, at the last it bite it like a serpent and sting it like an adder. Adder. On to Thursday. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. And it reads, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Now Friday, and we read from Ecclesiastes 5 verse 18. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and com comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun, all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is, for it is his portion. Now on to Saturday, finally, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah 13 verse 23, and it reads, can the, Ethiop, can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good, that are accustomed to do evil. Alright, happy Sabbath again people, hope you guys have a blessed and productive Sabbath. Alright, peace out. What a God who made the world Man and woman, boy and girl What a God who knows my name Though a sinner, he loves me the same What a God concerned for me The one who sets me free what a God who does the impossible. Oh, what a God. What a God who came to earth. In a manger was his birth. What a God all pain he felt. In a garden as he knelt, what a God nailed to a tree for all sinners, you and me. What a God who loves eternally. Oh, what a God. What a God who never fails. I the tail. What a God who changes not, no matter what. What a God who transforms me, makes me what I ought to be. What a God who still does miracles. Oh, what a God, what a God, oh yes, what a God, oh yes, what a God, God who still does miracles, oh, oh, oh what a God.
start with everyone. And good evening. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome each of you in here this evening. It's a pleasure to be with you all. It's a pleasure to be with you all in cyberspace. This evening for our AY program, we want to look at the topic, God in my backpack. Right? The AY team has come up with a brilliant topic, and we're going to run with it this evening. Now, we want to look at really two things. How it is that we can study the Bible as young people, but how can the Bible impact or schooling. And we just want to look at a few principles to make it a little easier for us as younger persons to see how we can study the Bible and how we can make an, a better impact, in, especially at school. So before we start, let's pray quickly. Your kind loving Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share with your people. And I pray, Lord, that you will inspire me. And I pray the words, Lord, will make an impact this evening. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, to start things off this evening, I'd like to ask us one question. How do you learn? When you, when you, when you watch a movie, when you go to an event, what do you remember? What do you remember? You remember the songs? All right. What, is, what, what do you guys remember? You see a young lady for the first time, what do you see? It's the person. You see a, you see a female. That's good. <laughs> Ladies, when you see a male, what's the first thing you see? His face? His smile? All right. Thanks, guys. But for me... I see how I see how she I see how she's put together. That's the first thing. <laughs> now, the reason why I ask about learning styles is that when I was studying, I wasn't aware of my learning style. I went to watch a going to watch a short video on learning styles, and I want us to incorporate learning styles in how we study the Bible, but also how we study our academic work. All right. Now, before we jump into the video, there are four learning styles, basic learning styles. Um, you can skip. So we have the visual, we have the visual learner, we have the auditory learner, we have the reading, writing preference, and we have the kinesthetic. Kinesthetic means hands-on, right? No. I know for me, especially if I'm in a math class, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen. Right? I'm going to listen and I'm going to try and catch the principles. And I realized that when I'm in other classes, I would try to do the same thing for other classes and it just didn't work. Right? Because reading subjects and practical subjects, you interact with them a little differently. All right? So we're going to skip to the other slide now, and then we're going to play a video. And I want you guys to pay attention and start thinking about what learning style you have. Here's Jonathan studying for a test. And studying, and studying, and studying. And here he is getting his test results. All that studying and he still got an F. Why? The thing is, there's no one right way to study. Some methods might work great for one person and not at all for others. Everybody learns differently. 
In order to find a study method that's best for you, it's important to know your learning style. The four most popular learning styles are visual, auditory, reading, writing, and kinesthetic, or hands-on. For most people, one of these methods will work best, but it's also possible for a combination of different styles to be effective. To discover your learning style, you can complete an online assessment. There's a wide variety of them available, consisting of multiple choice questions. However, you can also observe yourself and your previous learning experiences to get an idea of how you learn best. Let's circle back to Jonathan. When he's in class and his teacher is lecturing, he gets distracted pretty easily. Words tend to go in one ear and out the other. But when his teacher starts using visuals, Jonathan finds it easier to focus and understand the material. So he might be a visual learner. Now think about your history. How have you enjoyed learning in the past? Do you prefer watching over listening? Do you enjoy reading instead? Or maybe you learn best by doing, with hands-on experience. If none of these seem to grab you, give them each a try and see which one you tend to drift towards. Each learning style has its own study methods that work best with it. Let's take a look at how Jonathan and a few of his classmates study. As a visual learner, Jonathan finds it helpful to color code his notes. He finds it helps him to organize information and internalize it better. He also creates diagrams while studying, finding that they help him to better understand certain structures and ideas. Jonathan watches videos too, finding them helpful for extra information. Ruby is more of an auditory learner. She likes to study in a group and discuss the material with others. Sometimes she'll read her notes out loud because it helps her to hear what she's studying. In some classes, Ruby will record the lecture, with her teacher's permission of course, so that she can go back and listen to it later. Terrell finds that he learns best by reading and writing. He takes substantial notes during class and reads over them often. When he's trying to memorize something, he'll often write it out. He also makes sure to read and reread any materials his teacher has assigned the class. Raya is a kinesthetic learner. She's got a lot of energy and likes doing things. Labs and hands-on activities help her to understand certain ideas and topics. Sometimes she'll review her material while she's walking around. She also likes to take breaks in order to release some of her energy, allowing her to focus when she returns to studying. All four of these students are studying the same material, but they're doing so in different ways. Now, this doesn't guarantee that they'll all get the same grades, but by determining their learning style and finding study methods that work for them, they just might find themselves getting better results. GCF Global, creating opportunities for a better life. All right. No, I wish I knew this when I was in high school and when I just went to UWE. I mean, I wasted so much time trying to study. I would be, I'd be in the library just sitting around the desk, looking at the book, just staring at it, and reading over and over and over. And, and yeah, because that's our, that's our conception of, of studying. The other thing is when it comes to Bible study, many of us, I mean, how else do you study the Bible as opposed to sitting around a desk and reading it? That's really, that's our only conception of studying the Bible. But there's so many ways to interact with the Bible nowadays. You can, there's, there's, this, there's the Bible project on YouTube. You can literally watch the Bible, watch the principles being illustrated. You can listen to the Bible, right? And, well, maybe we have to raise, get a go for me and go to, go to the Bible lands and walk around and see the places. That, we could do that as well, right? But there, there's, there are different options that we can put in place to learn better and to better remember things and to be better students. No. For, for our presentation this evening, we want to look at three things. I want to share some principles with you as to what can help us stay focused as young Christians in school and as Bible students. And two, I want us to look at a few questions that we, re we realize that students generally have in the church, and we want to see how best we can answer them. And finally, I'll share, I'll share my story of how I made it through UWE. And I'll share my sojourn. I think many persons know I was at you for a long time, but we never, I never really broke it down. So we're breaking it down today. All right? Let's jump into it. So some principles. Now, the next slide, please. 
the first thing I want us to realize is that God is an excellent worker, right? God is the embodiment of intelligence and excellence. In Genesis 1 verse 31, God himself surveys his work and he is pleased with it, right? God says everything that he had made was good, right? He worked, he reviewed his work, and then he evaluated it, and he said, it is good. Now, I want us to, just to very briefly jump into a little bit of creation. Now, in Genesis 1 verse 9, God does something unique. In creation, he says, let the waters under the heaven be gathered on one side, hold on, hold on, hold on, guys, hold on. Let the waters be gathered on one side and let dry land appear. And then after this, God says, all right, let different, let different fishes and sea creatures abound in the sea. Now, very, very interestingly, God creates... God creates a space, and then he fills the space. And it's a very important principle when you're making stuff or when you want to achieve something, right? And we'll do, we're going to jump into this when we're talking about how can we make studying the Bible a part, of our, a part of our routine. But I want to keep this in mind. God creates a space, and then he fills the space. In other words, there must be boundaries, there must be boundaries, and there must be things that are filled within the boundaries. Let's, let's jump to the other slide. So, God plans, and he executes. Right? God plans, and he executes. And I want us to keep that in mind. God makes a plan, and then he executes. Now, let's look at a few of God's people in the Bible. So we established that God is an excellent worker. But let's look at an example of another young person from the Bible who, was, who did very well at, what he, at his field in a very strange country. In Genesis 39 verse 3, we look at the story of Joseph and we get this snapshot of the type of person that Joseph is. And it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And I find this... Very interesting. All that Joseph did prospered. Everything he touched. He was put in charge of the horses. Is that the horses get healthier? They run faster. Things are organized. They, he, get, he gets set up, thrown in prison. And in prison, he's, he's a person responsible for the running of the prison. And I want us to, I want us to realize that when I first came across Joseph, I had this conception that as God's people, God will show us some kind of special favor to make us excel. So we, we're, we're, we're in exam. We didn't quite study and prepare, but I'm a child of God. Oh, Lord, you know I'm your child. I am praying that today you intervene in my examination. Give me an A, oh, Jesus. Right? That was my conception of what Joseph, of how Joseph prospered. But let's take a little, let's look at a little insight that we get from Sister White on Joseph's life. The marked prosperity which attended everything placed under Joseph's care was not the result of a direct miracle, but his industry, care, and energy were crowned with the divine blessing. Joseph attributed his success to the favor of God, and even his idolatrous master accepted this as the secret of his unparalleled, I think his success, unparalleled, and mar the marked prosperity which attended prosperity, right, without steadfast Without steadfast, I'll read this slowly, because this part really hit me. Without steadfast, well-directed, 
effort. However, success could never have been attained. God was glorified by the faithfulness of his servant. Now, there are two principles here. One, Joseph had to be a diligent worker. He had to be a hard worker. His efforts were crowned by God's divine blessing. So God put a little extra troops on the top. Right? And I want us to realize that as young, as young persons, we, you, may be, you, may, you may be in a, a job, you might be in school, and you're struggling. And you may feel bad about struggling. And you, you're saying, I'm a child of God, I should not be struggling. However, I want to encourage you that the fact that you're struggling does not mean you're a child of God. But maybe it is that we need to find ways to be better organized and to put out better effort in completing our work. And when I came across this about the life of Joseph, it was very encouraging for me personally. Let's also look at another young person, Daniel. In Daniel 1 verse 20, we are told, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And I'd like, I'd like every young person, every Christian young person, to think about these two examples. And I want you to think about your current experience in school or your current experience in work. And I want you to ask yourself, can I attain a higher level of excellence? One. And two, can God be glorified from me working excellently? I firmly believe that as Christians, as young Christians, when we surrender to God and we put out the effort, we will shine for God. There is, there is nothing that will stop us from shining for God. And uh, I really want us to internalize these two stories, these two events, because they're very important to help motivate us forward. Now, there are two other texts I want us to look at. In Genesis 31, verse 6, we're told, And I, behold, I being God, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. God blessed men with talent, right? With, with, this, was, this was in Genesis where I think they were supposed to be making the, they were supposed to be preparing the ark. They were, making, they were supposed to be making the, it's supposed to be Exodus, you know. It's not Genesis. I'll sort that out later. So I think it's Exodus. It's not Genesis. Exodus, my bad. So they were, they were preparing the sanctuary, and God had outlined that there were specific things that were supposed to be made for the sanctuary. And God had placed talent within various men to make the articles of the sanctuary. And I really want to encourage us that God does not just give spiritual favor. He doesn't just save us from our situations. God blesses us with talent. He blesses us with the ability to play music, the ability to fix things, to create graphics, to edit, right? But he gives us these abilities to develop, to use for his glory and the upliftment of humanity. Now, this is becoming one of my favorite texts. In Isaiah 28, verse 29, we're given an example. And basically what God is saying, he says, so a farmer doesn't beat a seed into the ground with a hammer. It is what it is. All right. A farmer doesn't beat a seed into the ground with a hammer, right? Instead, instead, he uses a specific threshing tool or farming tool to dig the ground. And then God is saying that the wisdom that comes into this practical work comes from him. He says, this also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. We don't just serve a God that when give us bus fare, lunch money, food, when we're in need. We serve a God 
that will help to provide resources, skill, talent, and abilities. And as I said, this has become one of my favorite texts because it really reminds me that God is interested in your, in your intellectual development. He's interested in your professional development. And he's willing to supply what you need to be excellent in your profession. All right. So now we're going to, we're going to look at a, about six questions. Just tackling some issues that you yourselves have raised, and we want to look at some ways that we can address these issues as Christians and as students. Now, the first question is, I am already bright. Why do I need to pray for guidance? I'm already bright. Why do I need to pray for guidance? You know, very interestingly, I had a friend I was, when I just started here, I was doing mathematics, and I switched my major like three times, so I, switched, I started off doing actuarial science. So that's, that's one, I started testimony already, all right, right? So he was struggling with faith, and he said to me, no, Joe, if I pray to God, I pass my test. If I don't pray to God, I still pass my test. I just need to study. That's, that's, that was the conversation we had. Whether he prayed to God or not, he was going to pass his test. Right? He needed personally to take the responsibility for studying. And he had a point. I mean, and we actually looked at it from Joseph. God did not grant Joseph any free ride. He crowned his efforts with like an extra blessing. And it made me really think about why do I pray when I take a test, why do I pray when I study? It really made me think about this. And I realize that I pray because I want to remain focused in my relationship with God. And I want God to guide me at whatever I attain. If I attain whatever heights, whatever achievements I attain, I need God's guidance in my life. So if I get all A's, and I know have some jobs, some job offers. I need God's guidance in which job offer to choose that that's best for me as his child. Right? And brilliance is not, brilliance is not a, brilliance does not insure you from evil. As a matter of fact, if we remember the Nazis in the 40s, they had some of the most brilliant minds in engineering and physics. As a matter of fact, Research shows that the Nazis actually had flying saucers, right? I'm not, this is not conspiracy theory. Like, there's a toy company in Germany. They make replicas of Nazi, of Nazi warships, and they have, they have actually have one of a flying saucer. There are videos that they found hidden by the Nazis where they actually engineered flying saucers. There was a, there was a German scientist um, just before the war. He was working on the, there, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's something that happens with the upforce on a disc. He was actually studying that before the war broke out. And as the war broke out, the Nazis just roped him in. Right? So what I'm saying is that brilliance is not an insurance against evil. Right? And we have seen time after time that people have been using intelligence and brilliant strategies to, to do really terrible things and evil things. So we pray for guidance because we're asking God for him to guide us so that his work will be done, so that people will be uplifted, so that we will make the right choices with, the, with, the, with whatever skills and benefits we earn or gain. And there's a text I wanted to highlight. It says in John 16 verse 13, it says in the next slide, Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever ye shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. With the best knowledge and intelligence that you have, there are things in the Bible that are going to stump you, and you really need God to help you to get through them. 
Because if you do it on your own, I guarantee you, you're going to start an offshoot group. You're going to do something wacky and crazy, right? You need the Holy Spirit to help you to correctly interpret God's word and to correctly apply the messages to your life, right? It's extremely important that every time you open God's word, you ask him for guidance. It doesn't matter how, doesn't matter how, how brilliant you are. It doesn't matter if you have a PhD. Whenever you open God's word, ask his Holy Spirit to guide you in how we understand his word. And the, the other point I wanted to make was that it's important that whatever we do, that God is glorified. So we need to ask God's guidance so that whatever we do, that God will be glorified and that his purposes will, will happen. So let's jump into the second question now. How do I find balance between my academic studies and my Bible studies? How do I find balance between my academic studies and Bible studies? No, I started my master's online. I was supposed to start in January, right? I was supposed to start working in January. I did not start until about two months ago, right? I was supposed to start, I was supposed to officially start in January, but I did not end up starting about two, um, two months ago. Why? I could not find the time to focus and study. I was, actually, I was actually struggling with my Bible study and my quarterly. We recently moved, so we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not in, we're not this side of Kingston anymore. And I have to leave the house at six o'clock to get to work for eight o'clock. If I, I live near Red Hills, so if I leave my house after 6.15, I'm reaching my workplace 8.30, right? That's how fine the margins are. No, I realize that if I don't do something, I am never going, my money for my masters will be wasted, and my, spirit, and my spiritual life, I'm going to dry rotten, and I'm going to rotten away if I don't study my Bible. Like, literally, I need to study. I need to find a way to study. And... I decided to do this. When, as I reach home, I prepare for the next day. So if I have food to carry, pack it, put it away, press what I needed to press. And then, of course, if you have a special person in your life, you know, you have to give them some time. So I give that special person in my life some time, right? And then I go to my bed. And then I get up, at, I get up early in the morning. I get up like 3 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, I know it, it, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's how rough it is on me right now. And when I get up, I study my quarterly for about 15 minutes or half an hour. And then from about, say, 4, 3.30 or 4 o'clock back down to about 5.30, I study. What that did, I created a special time for study. And I created a special time where... It's very, un there's nobody up in the morning. Nobody's calling me at that time. No one should be calling me at that time. Should, no one shouldn't be calling me at that time, right? And apart from neighbors whose alarm, whose the alarm for the house goes off at some odd times, nothing is happening, right? And remember what I said earlier about God creates spaces and then he fills them? That's what, that's what your timetable is. You need to create specific time for certain things. For the things that are very important, you need to have a specific time. So how we create balance between academic and Bible study is this. We have to make a decision to create specific time blocks for your devotional life. No, it is, the principle is to do it morning and evening. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the ideal principle. However, it's important that you, if you if, let's talk about a quarterly. I've seen people study the quarterly in the middle of the day. So I, I knew persons when I was, when I was going, when I was, especially at UWE, that actually you see them with a the quarter that they go into the library, they study the quarter and then they study. So they found, a, they, found a, they found a time where once they had some free time, they studied the quarter before the day and then they studied. Right? So there are two texts I want to share with you. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, it says, To everything 
there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And in, so what that is saying is that we, everything, every purpose there is under the sun, there's a specific time for it to take place. And I've realized that when we get in the habit of blocking time and planning for things, right, we will learn how to execute better. So my, my advice is to, to better balance your Bible study and your academic study, make specific times for them. So for me, I work early in the morning. I get up at, I either do two things. If I miss my three o'clock appointment myself, I stay back two hours after work. So my work finishes at four, I stay back two hours, and I do my reading for my MBA. Right? If I do, if I, if I catch my three o'clock appointment in the morning, I study, and then I get to leave work early and I come home. Right? So that is how I am finding balance between my academic studies and my Bible studies. The second principle I want to share with you guys is in Philippians 2 verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I want to encourage us to take responsibility for our salvation. Right? As young people, we're not saved as a result of the family we're from, from the conference we're from, or from the church we're from, we're saved as a result of our own personal relationship with Christ. And we have to make time for God. We have to seek God. God is seeking us. He's reaching out to us. But we have to make ourselves available to meet with God. And it's very critical that we take responsibility for our own salvation. So we're going to jump to our third question, and that is, should we use the same approach for Bible study as we do for our academic studies? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, I'm going to, I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to say no, and I'll explain. I'll explain why I say yes and no. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you an illustration of what the yes will look like. In, on one hand, yes, there are skills you learn about analysis, and you get more details the higher you go in education. There are more details that come. There are more knowledge you get from certain topics. And with this knowledge comes application. When you're able to apply different things, you get more insights. So that's one. So there is... There's analysis, that there's, there's deep analytical skills that you learn. There are tools you learn to use as you, get, as you get older. For instance, if you're doing research methodologies, you learn about um, how to analyze data. You learn how to represent data. You learn how to research data. As a matter of fact, there is this magazine sometimes I follow. It's called creation.com. And they had actuaries use statistical modeling to make an estimate of how many people were on the earth at the time of the flood. And would you like to guess what they came up with? How much? 3.8 billion? 7 billion. So based on their models, based on the statistics, and based on, I think they also used um, the oil reserves as well. They came up with 7 billion. And it's kind of scary, because how many people on earth right now? It's about 7 billion. So, for argument's sake, let's say Noah was down in Australia saying, a flood is coming, coming to the ark. How many people would have been in there? Today. Eight. Scary, isn't it? So, what I'm saying is that with, with some additional knowledge, there's some deeper insights that we can get from the Bible. The second thing is, as I, well, as I, I said before, cross-referencing. No, I'm going to know the no part of this is that there are some forms of analysis and methodologies that will not work on the Bible because we can't, we can't put God 
in a seat and ask him questions and ask him to explain himself. We cannot examine God. We are, we are finite. that God is divine. There's no way that we can use certain types of analysis that we learn in school to use it on God. That, that won't work. There are certain things that will need faith. If you, one of the first things you learn when you do mathematics in, if you do add math, and you do math in sixth form, there's something called axioms, right? Or something is axiomatic. What that means is that you, it, it needs to be true for the system of knowledge to work. However, there is no real proof to say that this is true. But in order for other things that we know to be true, this thing needs to hold up, right? So let me see if I can give an example. In mathematics, we, we usually, we, we, just, we naturally add, right? We normally, we, we normally add and we get one, one plus one is two. But there are a couple of assumptions we're making about numbers, <laughs> right? And it has to do with how numbers are combined. And there's, a, there's, a particular, there's, a, there's about four rules in math that we accept to be true, and they're called axioms. No. In, in our time, here in, as, as Christians, God creating the world is an axiom. Nobody was there. No one, no one saw God create. No one, no, one, no one observed creation. No one saw the creation playbook. Oh, so you use CO2 and you combine it with these molecules and boom. Boom. No, there, there's, there's, we, we have no, there's no insight into that. We have to, by faith, accept Genesis 1 verse 1. So in that regard, we cannot use certain man-made principles to examine God. However, there are certain principles that we learn that we can explore God's creative world and get insights into God. No, I'll give you another example. When we breathe in, what do we breathe in? oxygen. When we breathe out, what are we breathing out? Okay, that's, that's one, two, three, right? Simple. No, God creates Adam, right? And he bends over Adam and he's about to breathe into him the breath of life. What is it that God is kickstarting Adam's respiration system with? Based on what we understand about respiration, what is it that God is breathing into Adam to kickstart his breathing system? No, man. No, no. No, no, no. Remember, remember, remember. Follow me, follow me. Uh, Ad man breathes in oxygen. Oxygen. Right? No, no. Hold on. No, no, no. no. The, the, that. It's interesting you look at it that way. No, I understand, I understand what you're doing. But the point, the point I'm making is It's very powerful. It's overwhelming, actually. <laughs> God breathed oxygen into Adam. God, God's, God does not, God is God. He doesn't need to respire. He doesn't need the same systems that we use to breathe and to exist. He doesn't need that. But for some, some way, somehow, he has elements already in him. So he simply conjured a set of elements and he blew it into Adam. So you understand what I mean when deeper insight into the scientific world can give us a little deeper insight into how God is operating. Now, that is how I'm suggesting we can have, we can combine our biblical and academic studies. That is how we can have a richer experience. I'll give you actually one more example. Complex numbers. Who likes complex numbers? <laughs> Who remembers? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, big up. Who else likes complex numbers? Who else even remember what a complex number is? You don't like numbers. You remember in mathematics in fifth form, there's this, there's this when you did, um, you looked at the curve, you had, you have, um, you have, there are different types of equations. You have linear equations. I'm forgetting the name. I'm, I'm rusty, but 
quadratic, yes, <laughs> right? When you solve, a, when, when, you, when you find, in order to solve a quadratic equation, there comes a point where you have to find the square root of a particular number, and that gives you the solution for the equation. However, there are some equations where you have the square root of a negative number. Now, in our world, you know, in the way we understand things, that's just not possible. You can't, you don't have a square root of a negative number. However, if you think about, if you think about our world in different dimensions, hear me out now. If you think about, we only can see the physical. So there are angels around us. We can't see the angels, right? We can't see the, the spiritual realm, so to speak. So isn't there kind of a sense that these numbers that we that don't really exist in this plane but exist in another plane can actually be something similar to angels and the spiritual world. And uh, that's another thing I'm suggesting that with deeper insight, we have, a, we have deeper knowledge of, of God and how God works. But here is the guiding part. God does not contradict himself. Whatever Whatever is, whatever is established in God's word cannot contradict itself. So that's, that is something to guide your, your study. So as kooky as your ideas might get, remember that they, 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 they cannot contradict what God has already laid out in his word. So God's word is actually the guide as to how we explore certain things. No. The fundamental point I wanted to share about how Bible study and academic study can actually match up now is when we look in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we were given a couple of visions in Daniel. In Daniel 2, we're given the statue. In, in Daniel 8, we're given some... In Daniel 7, we're given some animals. In Daniel 9... We're given some more animals. And in Daniel 11 and 12, we're given some crowns, some kingdoms. Now, I want you to realize that we go from, we go from a, a big structure, a, an overview, so to speak, and then God is breaking down the overview into more detail. So the statue that you see there is broken down into different, into dif the, the statue is broken into different parts, is explained in detail as we go throughout Daniel. And this is not really new because God is a master teacher. Now let's look at photosynthesis. Now this is the, hold on. I was supposed to have, there, there are two, there are two photosynthesis, there's supposed to be two photosynthesis slides on the PowerPoint. There's a simple photosynthesis slide, which is for children, which are the teachers in primary and prep school. And then there's the complex photosynthesis slide that we learn in, in, in high school and in, in, in college. And I want us to realize that even, even, in, even as in our academic studies, we go from simple to complex. Right? And that's the same principles God used in his word. We, he, God goes from simple to complex. That's why there's no contradiction with God. Because even though there are complex things that we maybe argue about, can't agree on, but there's always a simpler com com um, complex or, or concept from before that can help us understand what truth really is. So, so what I'm suggesting to us is that when we, when we approach our studies, try and understand what the overview is and then try and understand how the overview is being broken down as you are going through your content. And it's the same thing with the Bible. Try and understand the big picture, and then try and understand how these other little pictures contribute to the big picture. Right? So those are the two things I want to share when we look at approaching our academic studies and studying the Bible. No, spoiler alert, I'm, I'm going to get nerdy. I'm telling you from now. Right? I'll go in deep on this one. So bear with me. 
but I'll, I went to, I'll, I'll try and make it as simple as possible so we can understand. Now, what, I'm about, what we're about to talk about is something in Daniel, and I'm not trying to convince you of any particular viewpoint. I just want to share with you how me personally is trying to understand this for myself. That's what I'm doing. Now, remember, this, so this question now, we're looking at how can I gain clarity if I'm struggling with the text, with the meaning of a text? And I decided to give you a text that I am struggling with right now. So let's jump into it. Put on your helmets. The first thing is pray about it. Now, as when we were going to the book of Daniel in our quarterly, I came across a particular text in Daniel 8 and 11 and 12. And it's always explained. I've always heard it explained. But to understand something as it is explained is really different from understanding it for yourself. And as Christians, as young people, it's important that we understand things for ourselves. Right? It's important to know what we teach and believe, but it's important to accept it for yourself and to know why you believe it. And I made a decision that I want to understand for myself what this really means. So I prayed about this. I said, God, I am confused about this. I'm seeing different views on this. I'd like to know, one, how can I properly examine this subject and how can I get clarity on it? So I prayed about it. The second thing is, what is the literal thing? What, what is literally on the page? So when you don't understand something, your aim is to try and understand what you don't understand. Right? When you don't understand something, the next step is to try and understand what you don't understand. When you understand what you don't understand, then you can get clarity. You understand? All right. The, second, the, the other thing I want to mention is that now look for similar texts to the situation. So you have a challenging text. You prayed about it. You have a little better idea of what you don't understand. Look for texts that have some similar principles, some similar concepts. Then... Find some tools, find a concordance, e-sword, blue letter Bible, blue letter Bible, the best thing since sliced bread in Bible study, trust me, blue letter Bible. Then check Sister White's writings, see if God has revealed anything to her to add some, to give some little insight into what you're studying, right? So... The text I was actually been grappling with is this is Daniel 8, verse 11. It says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of hosts, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, first of all, I had to, I prayed about it, then I looked at the text and said, What is the text saying? First of all, there are two he's. There's a he who is making himself, who's bigging up himself, then there's a prince of the host, right? So there's a he who is making himself big, you know, being all proud and boastful, and then there is a prince of the host. So there are two persons here. The second note says, by him, the daily was taken away. Now, sometimes when we're reading, we have to, there are certain words that are supplied. Sometimes when we want to understand something, Kind of just don't, don't look at the supplied word as yet. Then the second thing now was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now for time, I'm only going to look at the concept of taken away. And I'm going to show you how I have gotten a little more clarity on what this term means. So the next step I did now, I found other texts that were similar to it. And there are two other texts. There's one in Daniel 8, 11. There's one in Daniel 11, verse 31. There's one in Daniel 12, verse 11. And remember that the Bible is translating, the Bible is translating from a different language. So in, in the English version, you're seeing one word, but sometimes that one word is translated from different Hebrew words. Right? And in this situation, that's the case. There are two Hebrew words for which we get the term taken away, right? Now, the next thing I did, I went to a tool, and I looked up the term taken away, and I found the two, I found the two words. The two words are 
room, sore. So in Daniel 8 verse 11, we see room. And in Daniel 11 verse 31 is sore. And in Daniel 12 verse 11, it's also sore. Now in Daniel 8 verse 11, taken away, it's translated from room, which means to be high actively, to rise or to raise, right? To bring up, to exalt yourself. But the other two words come from a different word, which means to lay away, to leave undone, to be, plast, to be passed, to pluck away, to put down, to rebel, to remove, to revolt, right? To take away, turn aside, withdraw, right? Cut off. Now, I find it interesting that some persons that have one view only, only look at the room and say that take away means this because room means this. But however, I find that some persons don't realize that the text also has, is translated from another word, which means the opposite of to take, to, to exalt. It means to cut off, right? So that helped me to have a better understanding of where I would lean on what take away means, right? Now, I, did, I don't have the, the quotes from Ellen White, but there are two quotes that she, does, she gives on this matter. She's, on one hand, she says that the view that persons had, the pioneers had, was correct. But on the other hand, she says that this should not be made a testing doctrine. This should not be something that people should be forced to take a side or a position on. If God wanted people to have, a, have clarity on this, he would have supplied it long time, a long time ago. Right? In other words... It's okay to disagree. It's okay to agree to disagree on this point. It is not that important. No, the reason I mention this is that sometimes when people are speaking about this, they'll only tell you of one side. But it's important to understand what the content is saying. And even, even in academic writing, even when, we, when people quote statistics, or oh, statistics show that X, Y, Z. Is there other statistics that say otherwise? And this comes to critical thinking, right? So it's important to, one, break things down, and two, look at your sources and compare them, right? And when I came across Ellen White's writing, my blood pressure went down. I really calmed down about the situation, and I'm not that worked up about it, but I'm just taking my time going through the text, right? There are, there are more important things than understanding what daily and taking away is. And we have, there are, there's more concrete things to, to work off than these things. Right? But I'm just showing you how I have been dealing with a difficult text. All right? Now, for our next question, we have, does having a limited knowledge about God or a personal experience make studying the Bible difficult? And I found this question very interesting. And here's why. The, the Bible was made for people who are struggling and disconnected and lost. The Bible is one of God's methods to connect you to who God is. The Bible is, the, Bible is the word of God. So if you, if you want a personal experience, if you have limited knowledge, then we are invited to come to the Bible. Right? We're invited to come to the Bible. And there, there are two texts I want to highlight. In Romans 10 verse 17, we're told, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And in John 17, verse 3, it says, And this is, the life, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So, what the Bible is telling us, that if you want to build your faith, you need to know what God's word is saying. You need to understand what is it that God has promised in his word. We need to understand when we have difficult situations and we have God's word in our minds, then we have something to work off, something to work with. And 
I realized that this is how we build our personal experience with God. I remember, I'll give you an experience at, at school. I was going to do an exam, and my, my, I wasn't cleared. In other words, there, I still needed to pay some more money. But I decided that, I, just, I was going to try, I was going to put it to God. And I said, Lord, you promised that you look out for us. I went into the exam center, and I gave them my card, well known that the card's supposed to go, because uh, that's what happens when you don't pay. And they took the card, and they swiped it, and it went poop. So I just took the card, thank you, Jesus, and got to do my mid-semester exam. Right? The second, second situation I want to share with you is that I was supposed to do another mid-semester, but the mid-semester was on Friday. And this one was later in the evening. And I decided that I was going to keep the Sabbath. I was not going to do this exam in Sabbath hours. No, I calculated it. I had only about 10 to 15 minutes in the examination center. Right? This is, this is an hour and a half exam. I had 10 to 15 minutes. Right? I had 10 to 15 minutes to go in, do what I'm doing, come out, and then go home. I prayed. I said, Lord, you know the situation. I really want to honor you. Help me out, please. I went in there. I stayed, for, I stayed for 15 minutes, right? I stayed for 15 minutes. I passed the course. Long story short, right? Stayed for, stayed for 15 minutes. I, I, needed, I needed a certain amount. I wanted to take a certain amount into the exam, right? So it means that I had to get a certain score. So I went in the exam. You no, know, I had 15 minutes, and I knew the questions I was going to do, right? And I did them. 15 minutes, came out. Didn't fail. So... God works. The other thing I want to encourage us is that Jesus says he came for the loss. He came to cause sinners to repentance. And unfortunately, sometimes as Christians, we don't make sinners feel that way that they can come to God or they can come to the Bible. But Jesus is here for us as sinners. He's here for, he's here for people who are feeling lost and broken. And when, you, when you're feeling at your lowest, that's the time you dig into God's word. So we touched on that already. Now the, the, next, the next question that we looked at is how can I connect and share with my peers about God? Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some, some personal experiences. All right, let me share something first. I'm going to encourage us to see God personally. When, we, when we're looking to share our faith, when we're looking to impact persons for God, it's important that, we, that we're seeking God for ourselves, that we're seeking, to, we're seeking to know God. The second thing is I encourage us to, to be human, to be yourself, to be genuine. Don't, don't put on anything. Right? The second thing is, third thing is to be positive. Develop a positive attitude when dealing with persons. And for us to start small, find simple ways to reach out to people. And the last one is follow the impressions of your heart. Now, I was in a taxi, and it was Christmas time, and this man, look like a, a taxi man. I... Something I was impressed to, to talk to him. I guess I kind of kind of talk to everybody sometimes. And I was wondering, how, would, how do I break ice with this person? And there's a Christmas tree on the car. So I said to him, "Boy driver, you love Christmas, man." And when I said that, the driver just just broke out into this boyish smile. You know, imagine this thick man in a marina, right? And him here, kind of um, frazzled out just broke out into this childish, boyish smile and said, you know, Virgin, every time I think about Christmas, I just feel happy. And he started to tell me that when he was in the States, Christmas was just a really good time for him. And in a very simple way, I was able to connect with a man, a man I didn't think I could have any connection with. But just a simple question, an observation and a question. I said, boy, I look like you really like Christmas. Because out of everything to put in his car, he has a Christmas tree. Second thing I want to share 
is that when I was in high school, a very interesting thing happened. I bought one party, and the ladies in the canteen accidentally gave me two. So I come out to the, come out to the canteen, I have two party in my bag, and of course, you know, you walk in the bag, and you guys know how one party in a bag feel, right? But no, man, my bag feels a little juicy. Right? So then I, 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 some friends were around me. We look into the bag, and we realize that there's an extra party. Them say, yes, Gio, Christmas. God is good, Gio. And I say, no, man, I'll soon come back. I go back to the canteen, and I return the party. I come back. And out of nowhere, this third I was in, I think I was in first form. I third form, I run out of nowhere. Yo, 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 yo. You heard the youth that returned the party? I say, yeah. Yo, yo, you're a Christian, my youth? I say, yeah. Yo, you really love my youth? And it was very simple. But it was very profound for me. If I did, if I did the opposite, what would have been my witness to those persons around me? As simple as it is, you know. What would have been my witness around me? As in, this person, this person is in third form. I don't know where the person run out and say, yo, 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 you're, you're, the, you're the first form, you that return the party. Yeah. <laughs> right? So what I'm saying is, be consistent with your values. You really need to be consistent with your values. The third experience I'll give in college, I remember there was this one particular guy he would go out of his way to just say, just say some, some mean, just some unnecessary things. And I remember one particular day, we're going to the, we're going to the lecture room, and I opened the door, and I let some persons in, and he was in the group. And he says, yo, man, open, no, no, hold the door for me, my youth. Man, a bad man, don't hold the door for me. It's all right, cool. And I go inside. Forget about everything now, you know. One day he comes to me and says, I'm sitting down, eating a party, you know, an international student struggling meal. And he says, yo, mate, you're a Christian? I know at this time, I kind of don't really want to talk to him. <laughs> but I said, yes. And we stuck up a conversation. Long story short, he asked me to pray for him because he wanted, he wanted to turn his life over to God. What if I gave him a piece of my mind on the times when he was really giving me some stick? You know, what if I, what if I was unchrist like to him? You think he would have come and asked me to pray for him? So it's really important that we follow the impressions of our heart. Rakim, you have a... Oh. So I'm going to... All right, I'm going to... I have a I have limited amount of time, so I'm going to... I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to mix my, my testimony with the last question. So the last question is, how can I improve my grades if I'm struggling academically? No. This picture means a lot to me. This is the last slide, Dion. And there's a text that says, being confident in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to have to condense the story now. Sorry, guys. I went to you in 2007. I went to you with all my friends from high school, like literally all my, well, most of my friends from high school. I left you in 2015. I did not do, I did not do a PhD. I did not do my master's. I did not do medicine. Right? I did my degree. I switched my majors three times. I did mathematics, I did actuarial science, then I switched to a double major in mathematics, then I switched to business and entrepreneurship. Management studies, entrepreneurship. That's why I have the, 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 the yellow and red. And uh, there were times when I, I, wa I was going to quit school. I, I, was, I was going to quit school. I was going to quit school and work and sort out myself and then go back to school. And uh, there were times when I, I, didn't, I really didn't think I was going to, like I really did not think I was going to finish school. 
like I felt I was at school for high school all over again. And literally I was, but anyway, that's, when thinking about it, it's terrible. <laughs> but I was really down about it. As a matter of fact, I started very well. And I, start, I got into the AXI program from my prelim year. You, know, you, you normally get into AXI after sixth form, but I had to do prelim. And I got, in, I didn't, I got into AXI, I was actually put on the list before I went to first year because of how good my grades was coming from prelim. Now, there are two reasons why people don't do well in school. You have academic reasons. A, you're not understanding what's happening. You, you, you can't comprehend, but B, you have personal issues, right? And when you're struggling in school, you need to understand what's going on. Are you having an academic problem? As in, two plus two, does, you can't say how two plus two make four. Or is there some issues happening in your life, at home, with family, with yourself, that you are not, you're having struggle, you're having a challenge dealing with? The long and short of it, I actually had to go to counseling. And I had to recognize that this is something is happening. I'm not doing well because it's not that I don't have the capacity to do well, but I was not, I was not in the state of mind to do well. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a difficult choice, right? But I prayed about it. And you feel alone, especially in a, in a university setting. You feel really alone. And I remember I had to make a decision that I was going to cut my losses and move on. And with God, we can always have a new opportunity. And in Philippians 1 verse 6, we're told that being confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So now, I'll tell you some things that I did. So, all right, yeah, we're going to, the, we're going to, the, we're going to the slide before this now. So I started praying about it. And then, as I said, I started going counseling. The second thing now, I started looking for my options. I switched my majors in math two times, and I was still struggling. No, I, was, I always got math prizes coming up through prep school and high school. Always got math prizes. But for some reason, it was very, I couldn't, it was very difficult. So I decided, all right, instead of beating this out again, I went to switch my major. I started a business project. I started a website, and I started getting notes and books from my, my other math students. And a friend gave me a challenge to put out the website in three weeks. And I put up the website in like one week, and I got like over, over 50 people to subscribe to the website. So he said to me, Gio, how are you doing so fast? You should do entrepreneurship, man. And at the time, you know, I always have some crazy business ideas. I always, always have something in the back of my mind. But at that time, I started exploring options on the campus. What are some other things I could pursue? When I, when I, I switched, and I, when I looked around, I saw that there was a there's a management studies program, and they had an option to the entrepreneurship. And I felt very disconnected in math, because I was in actuarial science, and uh, it's a lot of figures. I, you're by yourself calculating stuff, and that wasn't me, right? That, that, that was not me, right? And uh, with entrepreneurship, I started doing things that, that was me. I had to do presentations, I did group work, I had to come up with business plans, I had to come up with ideas, and I found that that during that process, my, my attitude to work and school changed. And I got more, I got more involved in ADFEL at this time, right? I was involved with the, the, the I was involved at the, the cell group level, and then I became involved at the executive level, and I became president. It was, it was at these times when, so all these things came when I could, after I was, imagine if I had given up. Imagine if I had stopped. And in my effort to study better, I, 
I started to make, I, st I made my own whiteboard. Like, I went around, the whiteboards were too expensive, I didn't have long left in school, I said, you know what, I'm going to make a whiteboard. I made a whiteboard, and the long and short of it, I was able to make a business out of making that whiteboard. Now, my, one of my goals was to, was to be able to learn something that I could practically use in the real world. And uh, I have seen that two things, the business I started came directly out of the activities I was doing in my degree. The job I have right now is as a result of my degree and all the efforts I have been making in my personal business. No, I could not have written a better end to my university experience than that. And I really want to encourage us that in Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I pray that we learned something and that we'll be encouraged. And I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you. We would like to thank Giovanni for that wonderful presentation. Um, I guess the students at home and here at church, we learned something and that we can apply it going back to school and also in our daily lives. We'll now turn over to Uncle Bagley. He will do the rest. I too want to join in saying thank you to Brother Maddox for sharing his testimony. That last part, you, you will see a little bit as to how it ties in with um, the Vespa thought. I want to start with number 485, I Must Tell Jesus. We'll be singing the song. I invite you to stand. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He Jesus can help me, Jesus. 
I thank you. Invited to turn, you may be seated. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 1. And we'll be reading verses 1, 2, and 3. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, so I'll read in your hearing. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing, much fr bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Loving God and our Father, we pause now as we go into our Vespa thought. Lord, we thank you for taking us safely through another week. We thank you for the blessings we have been receiving from morning until now on this year, Holy Sabbath day. As I present myself here, an empty vessel, Lord, I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that someone will be inspired by what you have to share. Amen. I want us to focus really on trees. The verse 3 says, They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season, their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Now, something about trees. Trees mean different things to different people. But I just want to look at some of the things that comes out as you think about trees. Trees are a symbol of strength. They are an indication of fertile soil. Trees are a symbol of growth or production. And trees are a symbol of shelter or food. Now let's look at some similarities. Like trees, we take time to grow. Like trees, we produce. Like trees, we provide shade or shelter for each other or for others. Like trees, we break if bent and at some point we die. Like trees, we must establish roots. Roots give us firm foundations. Roots provide nutrients from the soil. Now, these are life's lessons which we learn, which we learn from. Roots don't always show how deep they run, but by how well the tree stands in the storms, we know they are deep. Not everyone bears the same fruit. Not all trees planted in the same soil yield the same fruit or has the same level of production. We produce differently, but we must produce. If we don't, then the husbandman will nurture and fertilize for fruit to come. If you are like a tree, then bloom where you are planted. It is for us to understand that though some trees have big, broad branches and a lot of leaves, there is something that has to take place before it becomes so lush and green. The tree spends time growing down. It spends time sending its roots down searching for nutrients, searching for a supply. We all need to spend time setting roots. We need to set roots in fertile soil. Soil that will give us good nutrients, will give us a good backbone, or what we call a, a strong physical uh, blueprint for us to continue growing. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have that in our health messages. 
There are different cycles that trees go through. And when a tree sheds its leaves, given time and the right conditions, it continues to grow by regenerating new leaves. So, so much like us, when life changes on you, lose those leaves gracefully and with hope of a better or brighter future. For Jesus is our husbandman and he will nurture us back to health. Like a mighty tree, let us stand firm and provide for all who may stop by to rest in our shade. It is not that trees don't suffer, and it is not that trees are always prosperous, but with a proper root system, the tree will survive the storm, the fire, the cold, the drought, whatever it is, if you don't have a solid foundation, you will perish. I implore upon you to set your foundation on Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He's our creator, and he will supply all our needs. I leave with you a, a quote. It says, Learn character from trees, values from roots, and change from leaves. This is from Tansim, Tasneem Hamid. And I like it because like trees, sometimes we have to put on a tough outward appearance. That's the bark of the tree to protect us from a lot of things that are coming around us. But the most important thing is like trees, we need strong roots. Prepare your roots and anchor them on Jesus Christ. As you go through the upcoming week with the challenges and we are being hit by new curfew times, whatever it is that the devil will throw your way, if you have to lose some leaves, lose them gracefully. But remember, Things won't get too bad that God will not nurture you and bring you back to health. We'll close by singing the final two stanzas of 485. Invite you all to stand again. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, makes of my troubles quickly and end. All of my troubles He is a kind compassionate friend If I but ask Him Jesus, I cannot bear.
tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Shall we bow our for prayer? Our gracious God and our Father, we thank you for keeping us throughout this another AY service. We thank you, Lord, for the messages that have been presented. We thank you, Lord, for blessing Brother Maddox with the wherewithal to come and to put the slides together and the research that was put into the presentation and for the information that was shared. We hope, Lord, that our young persons and those studying will put into practice some of the principles that he has offered. And Lord, may they be drawn closer to you. Father, for those of us who have finished studying, we should also apply those same principles into studying your word. Help us, Lord, to develop our roots so that when the time of shaking comes, we will sway, but we will not break. Forgive us, Lord, for all the sins that we have been committing. Help us to be righteous and to seek after you in the coming week. Watch over us as we depart from this place. Amen. Sin and want, we come confessing, Thou canst save, and Thou canst heal. Amen. We thank you for tuning in to Rollington Town Seventh-day Adventist Church, AY Programme.